morning, King Cove. My name is Pastor Corey. I'm one of the pastors on staff here at Kent Cove. This morning, we're going to be reading from the book of Genesis, chapter 12, beginning in verse 1 and going through verse 10. It reads, The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring, I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he went on toward the hills east, east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Then Abram set out and continued toward the Negev. Now there was a famine in the land and Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine was severe. Please join me in prayer. Bless us this day, O Lord, with vision. May this place be a sacred place, a telling space, where heaven and earth meet. Amen. This morning we continue to look at spiritual practices that we can use to understand how to live our faith better and more deeply. And this morning the practice that we're going to look at is getting lost, which doesn't really make sense at first hearing, but I think it will by the time that we get to the end of our time together today. One of the things that I discovered as I looked into this theme and this idea of getting lost is this is quite a rabbit hole. There is, if, if you stop and think about it, if you do any kind of research, look, at the, look into the Google machine or whatever it is and type in getting lost and you will find some crazy stories. And we have as human beings uh, this deep instinctual terror at being lost for good reason uh, some of the stories we look you can find are stories of people who are out in the wilderness and get lost and then of course die because they're lost but there's a whole science around this idea of getting lost and how it is that it and how it plays out and how we respond to that reality of getting lost. One of the stories I read was a, was a retired woman in her mid-60s who trained and prepared for a long, long time to hike the Appalachian Trail. And she was doing this well-prepared, well-supplied. She had a partner. Her husband was shadowing them in a car and supplying them every few days. And so this was a very well-thought-out adventure. Partway through their journey through the Appalachian Trail, uh, the partner that she was traveling with, there was a family emergency. She had to leave the trail and go back home, but this woman wanted to continue on on her own, and so she did so, and her husband continued to shadow her. Um, as she got into Maine towards the end of her journey, she, um, as hikers on the Appalachian Trail will do, had to take uh, uh, nature's call, shall we say, went off the trail a prescribed amount, got turned around, lost, was never found. Um, and as the story goes, as they uh, eventually found her remains and her campsite, they found that she had survived for 19 days. 
and kept a record and, and sealed it up in a waterproof bag um, as, as she knew that the end was coming. And uh, as they found this um, campsite and realized a couple of things. One, she had set up camp and done pretty much everything right with the exception of wandering for a little while, but she was less than a half a mile off the trail. And searchers had come within a hundred yards of her at one point during that time. And so we hear these stories and, and we kind of get that feeling, right, of like, that we understand why getting lost is such a visceral fear for us. And as we think about what it means to get lost and what it means to live in what uh, we would call liminal space. Liminal space is that space that's kind of in between. It's not here and it's not there. And liminal space oftentimes is where God does the most amazing work in our lives. Because we are unmoored and because we are in between here and there and we find ourselves either willingly or unwillingly broke open that allows God to get into that space and do things in our lives that He wouldn't have if we had stayed either where we were or at our destination. So there's something that happens in that in-between space which when you think about it, we see in Scripture, right? We see it in the story we just read, the story of Abram. We see it in so many other stories in Scripture. We see it in the story of God's liberating of His people from Egypt and their time in the wilderness. We see it in the story of Jesus Himself when He's driven into the wilderness, into this in-between space. So I want to think this morning about this Abram story and what it might invite us into. The first thing I want to remind you of is that it is, and this is important, I think, as we try to form practices in a way of life that is formed by God. It's to remember this, that from the very beginning of the story, verse 28, chapter 1 in Genesis, God's intention has always been to bless humankind. I think sometimes we lose sight of that fact, right? The story of Scripture really from the very beginning, from the very creation of humankind has been God's pursuit of relationship with us and God's pursuit of blessing to us. And I think oftentimes we lose sight of that, like I talked about a few weeks ago, where we start uh, a little further down in Genesis, where we've broken stuff, and we have this idea that God's intention is to discipline us, which is part of what God does, but God's primary intention is to bless us. And in the story of Abraham, we're reminded of this. A couple of things about this journey that I think are, especially for those of us who you know, maybe we've heard this story a lot, and we kind of do that thing where we go, oh, yeah, yeah, I know this one, and then blah, 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 and we get to the end, but we kind of forget some of the details. The first is this, this idea of God showing up and, in, and calling uh, Abram and to leave his family and follow him is pretty insane. This just didn't happen in that culture. You just didn't leave your father's household, right? Because what does it mean to leave your father's household? Well, for a person to leave their father's household is to leave the security of their clan. It's to leave the security of whatever wealth has been amassed and you will inherit. It's to uh, leave the security about what your future is and to enter into an entirely unknown space, into the wilderness, if you will. So when God shows up and says to Abraham, leave your father's house and go to this land that I will show you. Now remember, no maps, no Google, no GPS, none of that. It's just, hey, Abram, come 
follow me. Leave everything you have. Leave the security of your family. Leave the security of your clan. Leave the security of your father's wealth, whatever, whatever that might be, and come and go to this land that I will show you. Right? How many of you have ever started a journey because you, had, you woke up with this idea that I feel like God's telling me to go somewhere? Oh, really? Where is God telling you to go? Not really sure. He said he was going to show me. And you go and tell your family and friends that, well, God told me, he called me, and he said that he's, he wants me to follow him to this land that he will show me. Uh, they're all going to look at you and go, he did. say what now? You're going to do, huh? you're going to do, you're going to leave what you know. You're going to leave the security of everything we have to go somewhere. It's a pretty outrageous story. And sometimes I think we lose sight of that. Then as the story goes, we, you know, if we were to read through all of the chapters that follow where we left off, chapters 12 through 20, we learn you know, God has promised Abram that he is going to make a nation out of him, right? Now remember, Abram's 75 years old. Sarah, his wife, is old too. He makes this promise. They leave. They're following. They're going to find this land that God will show them. And alternate, it kind of alternates in the story as it goes. Um, Abram screws up a number of times. He jeopardizes the journey by, um, as one uh, commentator said, failures of nerve and hope and holds to it by faith. So it's like, it goes like this. In one chapter, Abram will do something like, oh, I don't know, say that Sarah's his sister. Uh, <laughs> problematic on a number of different levels. Uh, or, you know, and, and he makes these mistakes. He loses sight. We kind of forget when we tell this story that Abram uh, is promised a family. He's promised that God is going to make a nation out of him. And they leave everything they know, and it is 25 years from that promise to the birth of Isaac. 25 years. That's a long time. I can imagine that there must have been days and months when Abraham and Sarai were like looking at each other, and maybe, maybe it was more Sarai looking at Abram and saying, you said that we were going here. You said that it was going to be this. Right? How many of us can relate to that where we follow the path that we think God has called us to, and once we get into the journey, it seems like God is nowhere to be found. And we're wandering around in unfamiliar territory, not knowing exactly what it is that we're even looking for. Now, one of the things that's interesting as we think about this is that Abram and Sarah, Sarah and all their people that went with them are out following this promise. And they do so haltingly. And we have this sense that they, you know, I think sometimes when we hear the story, we have the sense that they just marched through time and marched through space and they knew exactly where they were going and how they were going to get there and what it was going to look like when they showed up. But none of that's in the text. What's in the text is a lot of ambiguity. What's in the text is a lot of space And a lot of unanswered questions about what that journey looks like. How often did they feel lost? And yet, they followed. And they kept moving. And they made it through those tough spots. They made it through even the places where they made mistakes. And didn't trust the way that one thinks they should have. One of the things that's interesting is I was reading about this idea of getting lost is one of the instincts that comes up in people when they are lost is that fight or flight instinct, right? You get 
you read these accounts of people who get lost, and you hear that they often literally run in circles. And, they make, and they're trying to get out, and they kind of thrash about, and, every, and you kind of, you know, from the comfort of our seats, we go, well, why, why are they doing that? That's not what you're supposed to do, right? So I read about a couple of different experts in this field. There was one, a British guy named Ralph Bagnold. I don't know if I'm saying his name right, but this, this dude was the pioneer of desert exploration in North Africa during the 1930s and 1940s. He was the founder of the British Army's Long Range Desert Group. Apparently, this guy knew some stuff about navigating in the desert, right? That's what he did. And um, he was out in the western desert in Egypt, and he got lost. And he reports that he had an extraordinarily powerful impulse to carry on driving in any direction after losing his way. He said the psychological effect has been, that psychological effect has been the cause of nearly every desert disaster of recent years. He goes on to say, if one can stay still, and this is so British, I love it, if one can stay still even for half an hour and have a meal or smoke a pipe, (laughs) reason returns to work out the problem of location. Another person I read about was a a psychologist in Halifax, Canada, who studied, um, spent his career studying how lost people behave. He reviewed over 800 search and rescue reports from his home province of Nova Scotia, which is 80% forest and is known as the lost person capital of North America. It says, in Nova Scotia, you can literally get lost by stepping away from your backyard. (laughs) He said that out of these 800 cases, he only found two of those of lost people who did the right thing, which is to stay put. Those two people were, one was an 80-year-old woman who was out picking apples and got lost, and she stayed put. The other was an 11-year-old boy who had taken a -a hug-a-tree-and-survive course at school. (laughs) So they teach these kids, apparently, if you get lost, you grab onto a tree and you just stay there. And that's what he did. And And he was found. But he said that most lost people are stationary when they are found. But usually it's only because they have run themselves into the ground and are too tired or ill to continue. So as I think about what it means for us to get lost, what it means for us to follow God when He shows up and invites us to follow Him to this place that He's going to show us, is that we too have that impulse when things get hard, when things get tough, when we're in the middle of that 25 years between the promise and the fulfillment of the promise and we're wondering where God is, the impulse is to take off in any direction that we can because moving is better than being still. I think the spiritual practice of getting lost is being willing to stay put, to stay in the midst of that journey and allow God to bring that new thing to pass, to get through the discomfort. One of my favorite um, lines in one of our communion liturgies in in our covenant book of worship um, is we have a liturgy that is a narrative form, and basically it tells the story of Scripture from beginning to end through the liturgy of communion. And one of the lines it says about Jesus is this. It says, He began his public ministry first by gathering a group of persons to be his disciples. Persons having little in common, often hostile to each other. Does that sound vaguely familiar in our current context? Having little in common, often hostile to each other, and this is the part I love. Each not knowing the outcome of their going with Jesus. 
You see, friends, one of the things that I, where I think we fall short in the church when we talk about the gospel, when we talk about following Jesus, is we talk about following Jesus as if that it, you accept Jesus into your heart, and from that moment on, life will be nothing but roses and other nice things. <laughs> My metaphor ran out on me, Right? I mean, we talk about it like, oh, well, if you accept Jesus, everything, health, wealth, and happiness, right? That's not the gospel, friends. That's not the witness of Scripture. The witness of Scripture is that faith is a journey, and sometimes that promise isn't delivered for decades. Sometimes the fulfillment that God has promised us doesn't come for a long, long time. And there are seasons when we feel lost in the wilderness and we simply want to strike out in any direction that we possibly can instead of staying put and allowing God to do what God does, which is to make all things new, to bring restoration and hope and grace and yes, in the case of Abram and Sarai, laughter, Isaac, the child of the promise. So friends, I don't know where you are on the journey, on your journey today. Maybe you're just starting out. Maybe you find yourself here this morning and you are sensing that there is a call, that God is saying something to you. Maybe it's just that you can't, for as much as you don't have any time for church, you just can't let go of Jesus. And He keeps inviting you back and you don't know where that's going to take you. Friends, just take that step into the unknown. Begin that journey. Follow Jesus where He leads. Or maybe, maybe you're in the midst of that liminal space. You find yourself between the promise and the fulfillment and you are wondering, where did you go, God? Why have you called me out and now left me here to wander around on my own. Well, that's okay too. There's room for that as well. And if you are angry with God, and if you're struggling with wondering where God is, guess what? He's big enough. He can handle it. You can say it. Read the Psalms. There's some stuff in there that will curl your hair as far as how they talk to God. So if you find yourself in the midst of that liminal space and you wonder where God is, cry out to Him. Speak your mind. And I think you will be surprised to find that He's right there with you. Or maybe, friends, you find yourself, you feel like you're in the promised land and you have received everything that God has promised. In that case, give Him thanks and gratitude and pour it out onto your neighbors. But friends, wherever you find yourself, know this. God is for you. God is with you. God is guiding you whether you feel it or not and His desire, just as it was at the very beginning, is to bless you and the world through you. Please join me in prayer. Gracious God, we thank You that You are a God who loves us and seeks after us. And we pray, God, that You would help us to trust the journey, even and especially when we feel like we're lost. Help us to rest in your presence, even in those desert places. And then help us to pick ourselves up and to follow where you lead. In Jesus' name.